Excellent. Thanks for joining us. We'll just be waiting a minute or two for people to join us and then uh, we'll get started. So in the meantime, we are here, <laughs> but uh, we, we won't start. <laughs> Another 20 seconds. Right. Sounds good. Let's do that. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, this, uh, my name is Kamio Mahadas. I'm a macroeconomist at the Cambridge Judge Business School and a fellow in economics uh, here at King's. Uh, welcome to our, I think this is the first day of the fully online uh, King's uh, Alumni Week. Um, and uh, we, this, uh, this event, in this particular event, which will be um, for an hour, uh, will be on Will Alan Turing's technology bring about Keynes's economic possibilities? So um, just a few housekeeping things before I hand over to our uh, speaker is that uh, one, you can see me and uh, you can see Shranga, but you can't see yourself <laughs> and you can't, nobody can see you and uh, we, we can't hear you, but you can communicate with us through the Q&A box. So I, I, as soon as you have a question, please put them through. And as soon as we finish the presentation, then uh, I'll be basically moderating the questions and asking them. So uh, put in your questions uh, whenever you want. Um, I want to also, uh, just one thing that this event is being recorded and it will be available online in, um, in, in a few days, hopefully. Uh, and uh, as I said, although you, you, you won't be able to communicate us, uh, with us through your microphone, you will be able to communicate us through the Q&A chat. So um, it's, it's a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to have uh, our speaker talking about, from an economist's point of view, a super interesting topic. And uh, I'm sure there will be some interesting things that economists will say as well, uh, those of us in the audience. And um, so just a short bio, because uh, I want to give the time over. Uh, Shranga Chandratele is a computer scientist by, by training from Cambridge, obviously, and at King's, and a venture capitalist by vocation. And in between his time at King's and uh, his day job today, he was also, as some of you might know, amongst other things, uh, the US Chief Technology Officer at Aut Autonomy PLC. That's the UK's largest AI company. So he really knows what he's uh, talking about today. Um, so without further ado, I, I'll, I'll turn over to you and I'm really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Kamiya. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's, it's sad not to be able to see you all. Um, last time I gave this presentation, uh, I did it in college um, and you know was able to to see everyone and meet with people in person. Obviously it's a different, we're living in a different world right now, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll still recapture some of that. Um, and as Kamiya said, it's a, it's a topic that sort of tends, tends to generate a few, a few bits of controversy. So, you know, would love some questions. Um, there's, there's one of these areas where there's clearly no single right answer. Um, so what I'm now gonna do is um, share a, a small PowerPoint I have, which I'm actually going to use. Uh, Kamiya, give me the thumbs up if you can see that. So I know, okay, that's great, we're good. Um, so yes, um, the title of my presentation is um, Keynes, Turing and the Economic Possibilities of Artificial Intelligence. Um, let, me, let me dive straight in because I'll sort of introduce the topic as we go. Um, in, tw in, in the year 2000, so 20 years ago now, uh, Time Magazine, which of course is famous for picking a person of the year every year, um, picked 100 people of the year, of the millennium. Um, and uh, Keynes had the um, interesting distinction in that it was the one uh, academic institution that actually had two people in that list, um, not just one. Um, and those two people are the two people you see in front of you, um, John Maynard Keynes and Alan Turing, um, both of whom I'm sure require absolutely no introduction to, to any of you, regardless of your subject area or interests. Um, now, you, you could think that apart from Kings, there wasn't much tying these two men together. Um, but actually, there is one interesting sort of um, related topic, and that's really what I want to talk about today. And that's this related topic is expressed 
uh, through two papers that were written by the two of them. Um, the first one by Keynes in 1930, uh, the economic possibilities for our grandchildren. And the second one um, was, a, was a separate paper on computing intelligence written by, by Alan Turing 20 years later in, in 1950. Um, so what I'd like to do is sort of talk you through, through the two um, papers and, and really sort of how, how the two are related. Um, so let's talk about Keynes first of all in this, this short paper. Um, if you get a chance, even if you're not an economist, um, I can thoroughly recommend reading this, this um, paper. It's, it's, it's really an essay. It's about four or five sides of A4. Um, it's written in a very eloquent style. I wish that more um, sort of scientific or academic papers written in this style. It, it isn't full of, you know, innumerable, um, indecipherable charts. It's elegantly, eloquently proposed argument with just the, the, the sparsest bit of data required to make the points he wants to make. Um, it's, a, it's a fun read and it gives you a, an insight into the brain of obviously a very, very brilliant man. Um, and, but the core of what he talks about is this idea of, of capital wealth increase and the fact that um, since the sort of days of colonial empire in Europe, um, you know, the, 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 um, in his opinion, the sort of um, the, 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 amass, the amassing of, of wealth from that led to a scientific and technological boom that lasted from the sort of 17th century through to his own time in the sort of 19th and early 20th century. And in that period, um, uh, there was such an investment in technology and science that we had the development of innovation that made um, humans more productive and work more productive. And um, that would lead, in his opinion, to the increase, to a natural increase in the sort of sum capital of the population of the planet, um, of the sort of value. And, and, and the way he looked at it, and it was sort of very um, kind of landed gentry way of looking at it, I suppose, is that if capital increases, then you can obviously derive an income from that capital. And his argument was that actually, um, given the sort of compounding nature of this capital increase over time, that within 100 years, in other words, his grandchildren's time, um, he felt that there might be enough capital on the planet to be able to cope with um, what he called the economic problem, which is basically the fact that today, or in his day, mankind had to work very hard in order to generate the value required to pay for their life. Um, and so maybe actually there'd be so much passive income coming from this capital that had increased that people wouldn't need to do that anymore. Um, and, and therefore you'd get this point where your absolute needs would be satisfied um, and in the sense that, you know, then, then, you know, any future, any further energy you had as a human could be, could be devoted to whatever you wanted it to be devoted to. It could be more economic activity, but um, he hopes for, 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 for maybe, uh, maybe larger minded things like, like art and philosophy and, and just spending time with one's family and in nature and so on. Um, he, he does talk a little bit about the fact that there is something very human about liking work. And he admits that we all like to be involved in some kind of activity. Um, but he suggests that actually, if you just did a few three hour shifts, maybe a 15 hour week, that would be sufficient to sort of deal with that raw desire we all have to work. And then after that, we could spend all our time doing all these other fun things. Um, I don't think I need to tell any of you that we haven't reached this reality. Uh, we're not quite at the 100 year mark yet. We've got 10 years left, but something pretty dramatic would have to happen to this graph um, in order for us to um, see a fruition of, of, of what he's seen. By the way, this, this data goes to the year 2000. Um, I've recently found newer data, which I hadn't had time to plot on here basically flat and there's no real change uh, across across the globe um, if you were to uh, this is sort of certain western countries uk us and france if you were to plot in places like asia actually the, the chart if anything is increasing so um, you know the overall picture is not is not good um, there is a big dip there that you see uh, in the 30s um, and actually that there is a sort of slow decline until about the 1970s and then after that it increases again um, and and um, so you know yes to some extent the, um, the, the work week has gone down, but it hasn't gone down completely. Um, and so the, the, the question is, um, why is that? And, and, and is there anything that Alan Turing can teach us? So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, Turing wrote a paper in, in nine, uh, sorry, sorry, before I get to that, uh, Turing, of course, is, is famous really for two big things. I think most members of the public, if you were to ask them what Alan Turing did, they'd talk about the breaking of the Enigma codes and, and, and the cryptography work that he did in the Second World War. Um, obviously, crucially important stuff, arguably, as, as, as um, responsible as, as any other individual for, for ending the Second World War. Um, and the second thing that, you know, the, the, the more um, cerebral we'll talk about is the idea of the Turing machine. Uh, this was the, the church Turing thesis, which Turing um, proposed, which um, essentially allows um, computer science to be reduced 
down to very, very simplistic machines. And he was able to provide the mathematical evidence that showed that these machines are effectively algorithmically equivalent, which means that although um, machines can get, you know, computers can get faster and they can do more things as a result of that, they can't really fundamentally change what they're able to do. Um, interestingly, quantum computing, which is a very new field, is beginning to push the boundaries of some of this. Uh, but, but, you know, certainly his, his, his theory um, holds still, uh, holds very steady until that point. Um, but actually less known uh, for Turing, but I think an interesting thing that he did was in 1950, he, um, he wrote a, a, wrote, he wrote a, a, sh a short paper. Um, and that short paper um, was all about this idea of, of, of really what we call artificial intelligence. And the way he, um, if I take that back, the way, the way he, he did this was he proposed a little game. So he, he describes a game that apparently was a, was a popular parlor game uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, this is the sort of thing I think people did before they had television. Um, and the way the game works um, is that it's played by uh, three people, a man and a woman, um, and a third person who's known as the interrogator. The man and the woman um, sit on one side or stand on one side of a, of a closed door. The interrogator stands on the other side. Um, the interrogator is allowed to ask questions out loud through the door. Um, on the other side of the door, the man and woman pick one of them as being the answerer. Um, and that person sticks in that role for the rest of the game. And either he or she answers the question and then slips the answer through the door. Um, and the interrogator reads the answer and can ask a number of questions. And the aim of the game is at the end of however many questions, 10 questions, 20 questions, the interrogator has to guess if the person on the other side of the door answering the questions is the man or the woman. Um, so possibly a little sexist and everything else, but you know, the idea being that you should be able to figure out whether it's a man or a woman answering the question, depending on, on how they're answering the question. Turing takes this idea and says, what if we put, uh, what if we added to the man and the woman a machine? And would it be possible to build a machine that when fed the questions given by the interrogator, so in other words, very, very human questions, um, that they could, um, they could um, uh, uh, you know, provide answers that, that, that could either you know, be, that, that could either be confused as either a man or a woman, and moreover be confused as being a human. Um, and, and his argument is that um, you know, rather than trying to do, define complicated um, solutions or mathematical tests for this question of can machines think, you could ask the question this way and play this game and say, well, you know, if, if a human on, on one side of a closed door cannot tell the difference between a human and a machine, then arguably we've created a machine that can think, that can mimic humans so well that it's the same as thinking. Um, and, and really, that's the first true definition of what artificial intelligence could look like. Um, and this idea of this, this um, test based on this game, the imitation game, uh, is, is known as the Turing test. Um, and for many years, it's sort of been seen as a sort of playful bar to hit for artificial intelligence researchers. Um, you know, people have, have hit it, of course, already, but it's an interesting way of thinking about AI. Um, and so, you know, if you were to read um, uh, more recent headlines, and I've picked a few here from the last sort of few years, um, you could think that actually this, this world of AI that Alan Turing was talking about has arrived. Um, you know, it seems that apparently, you know, robots are, are all conquering now and, and artificial intelligence is, is all powerful. And you could also be forgiven for thinking that actually that's going to deliver on, on Keynes's idea. Um, because a lot of the headlines that are attached to these things um, you know, talk about, as you can see here, the fact that this, these new artificial intelligence approaches, uh, these new advances in computer science will, will, will take a lot of human jobs. Um, obviously, you know, headlines being headlines, these are very negative headlines, but the positive way of looking at it, I think if Keynes was in the room, would be to say, well, this is great. You know, if, if machines can do all this work for us, humans no longer have to, the capital will still increase, the value will still be generated, we will all be able to head towards that 15 hour work week. Um, so, the, so the answer that I want to kind of head towards today is, is that really true? Is the AI of today um, actually magically in the next 10 years going to finally deliver on Keynes's uh, promise? And, and, you know, despite that slightly demoralizing chart, which looked very, very flat, maybe we're going to see an acceleration towards Keynes's number in the next 10 years. Um, to do that, I'm going to talk a bit about AI and what it really is, um, because it's one of these terms that people talk about a lot and people have vague ideas of, but I'm always sort of um, struck by the fact that people haven't had time to really think about it and really understand it. And I really want to demystify that today. And if, if there's one thing I achieve, hopefully that's what it is, because I think it's a really fun area and it's a really important area for us all to understand. Um, and without understanding it properly, it's very difficult for us all to have an opinion on it. Um, anyway, um, AI, um, very, very broadly speaking, and I'm going to hurt a few researchers here, but I'll, I'll keep it simple, breaks into two areas. One area is called symbolic AI. Um, this is the sort of historical type of AI that was very popular in the 1980s before it really failed to scale, failed to work. And the idea behind symbolic AI is to build complex taxonomies that describe knowledge in different ways. So if you can get into a doctor's brain, can you really figure out what he or she is thinking? 
coping with every question, with every test that they're taking? And can you use that to create a logic graph that figures out how they figure out that you've got you know, this particular condition and not that particular condition? It turned out that the complexity of mapping these sorts of human judgments is so great that symbolic AI simply didn't work. Um, and so for about 10 years, there was a deep funk in the AI world where it was seen as a, a failed subject and one that we were never going to solve. Um, more recently, particularly in the last 10 years, another kind of AI, broadly speaking, I'll call it function fitting AI, has taken off. The headlines we just looked at are all about function fitting AI. Um, and this is the AI that's captured the imagination of investors and venture capitalists like myself, technologists, technology companies, people like Google and Microsoft and Amazon, and also, of course, the, the headline writers at the various newspapers. Um, so how does that AI work? How does function fitting AI work? Well, the, the simplest form of function fitting AI, and actually the one that's used by far in, in the majority of cases, is this concept of the artificial neural network, which I'm sure many of you have heard. And again, it's one of these things that is, I think, comes across as more complex than it really is. So hopefully today we'll demystify this to, for, for those who, who haven't had a chance to do that. Um, so let me talk you through uh, briefly how, a, how an ANN actually works. Um, so we start off with a little blob, which, which I've got in the middle of my screen here. Um, and, and those of you who are mathematical we know, wouldn't know what I'm doing there, but um, this blob, think of it as a, as a, as a function. So there's going to be, it's, it's, a, it's, a, little, it's a little box. Uh, when it's supplied with a number, it takes that number, it performs some kind of equation on that number, some kind of transformation. It multiplies, it adds, it divides, it subtracts, whatever. And then it can spit out an answer as well. So, you know, if I put in the number four, um, there's some function here. We're not defining it right now. It just does something to that number. It takes the number four and it happens to spit out 18. And in isolation, it will keep doing that. Every time I put four in, it'll spit out 18. If I put three in, it may spit something else out. Who knows? Depends on what that function is. Um, now, it's obviously pretty clear that I can make this slightly more complicated by saying rather than having just one input for one number, why don't I put in multiple numbers? Um, so let's say I've now got this little function box and it takes in three numbers, 4, 34 and 61. Again, it takes all three numbers and it does something to them and it spits out a result. That result happens to be arbitrarily right now, number 22. Um, and it's sort of pretty obvious, again, I think, to say that if it can spit out 22 in one direction, it can, it can sort of copy that answer to multiple places, right? It can write down the answer more than one time. It's, it's created the same number. It's going to just sort of report it a few times. So with this simple unit, we can actually start to create what is known as a neural network. And the first thing you do is you create what's known as a layer of nodes. So you have um, not just one, but many of these little boxes. Each one has a different function. Remember, each one can accept some number of inputs. Each one will then transform those inputs in some way to spit out the same answer to however many outputs or uh, exits you want. Um, and this is just one layer uh, in, in the terminology, but there's no reason why you can't have multiple layers. And then what you do is you, you wire these layers up together. So in other words, um, you know, the, the output that comes out of F00, which is the top left one there, gets fed forward into a number of different nodes um, or, or boxes uh, in the second layer. Um, you know, that will then churn off new results based on all those inputs, which will then feed forward to the, the third layer and so on and so forth. It's a very, very simple, it's known as propagating layer structure. Um, and the numbers will get fed in at the, at the beginning and sort of go all the way through to the end. Um, so now let's look for a problem that we want to solve. Um, so this was um, one of the sort of early examples of a problem that the company DeepMind, which was later acquired by Google, uh, by, by Google um, sort of looked at, which was facial recognition. And this is one of the classic um, problems in, in artificial neural networks and one of the ones that's been solved really, really well. Um, as I think I'm sure most of you know, um, security systems now are extremely good at spotting people and recognizing who they are. Um, and so how can you tell you know, a given face from, from you know, a, a universe of hundreds or thousands of possible faces? Well, what you do is you have to train this neural network. And the way you do that is you start off um, by, um, by looking at those output uh, nodes, so the, the, the right handmost um, layer of, of the neural network, and you assign each one of those output nodes to an answer, one of the potential answers you're allowed to have to this question. Um, and so um, in this case, we're trying to recognize people from their photo. So let's give them all names. So, you know, this, we're saying that these four nodes, um, the, the top one there recognizes Saranga, the next one Sue, the next one Sam, and the final one Sarah. Um, and of course, if you remember, these nodes are going to output a number. So the way we're going to do this is that each of those numbers will be a confidence level. Um, if it, the higher the number is, the more confident this neural network is that it's found Saranga, for example, if, if in that top case. Um, if the third node down has a very low number, it's pretty certain the photo it's looking at is not Sam, uh, and so on. Uh, 
Um, and so, you know, this is the ideal case, right? You, you show a photo of me and ideally it would show a hundred at Saranga and zero in all three of the others. Now, the reality is it will never be that perfect because it turns out they will, we all have some similarities and it may be that I look a little bit like Sue or a little bit like Sarah or a little bit like Sam. Uh, but overall, you should see a, a bias towards me, which, is, which, which will be a success. Um, so how do we train the system to do that? Well, we take a, a picture, first of all, the person that you want to train the system on, and here's a picture of me. Um, and what you do is you have to break down this image into numbers, right? And that's very easy to do with a computer because you can zoom in on any part of my, my face and you can figure out that it's really made of a few separate distinct blobs of color. You can see there browns and grays and blacks, grays sadly, because I graduated from Queens 20 years ago now. Um, and then that can turn into a stream of numbers. Every number represents a color, right? So maybe 13 is brown, maybe three is gray and so on and so forth. Um, and then you can take those input numbers, the numbers from the picture of me and feed them into that input layer. So there are those numbers that we looked at earlier. Each number represents a color in this image of me. Each one is being fed into the, into the neural network. Um, and then each of those has been propagated in that way that we described earlier. And ultimately then with all those functions operating on each other, we will get um, an exit uh, and those exits come out. Now, the very first time we run this, this thing has no idea who Saranga is. And so it comes up with a bunch of pretty random answers. In fact, it thinks that this is either Sarah or Sue, for whatever reason, doesn't think it's Saranga. Um, so next comes the other important step. And this is um, what is known as reinforcement learning, another term that you might have come across if you've read about AI. And what happens here is that a human or some kind of other process that knows that this is a picture of Saranga provides that information back and says, okay, neural network, um, actually this was Saranga. So this, the, the top node should have been the highest number and the other three should have all been lower. So you give a positive reinforcement to the top node and you give a negative reinforcement to the other three nodes. That reinforcement, um, th that, that feedback then gets back propagated back through the network. So the negativity um, attached to the three bottom nodes gets pushed back to all the nodes that fed it. Meanwhile, the positivity on the top node gets fed back to all the nodes that fed it. Um, and what you then do is show this image, sorry, show this um, network, many, many, many images of Saranga and of Sue and of Sam and of Sarah. And each time you provide this back propagation of reinforcement to help the system understand um, who's who and who looks like whom. Um, and over time, what you do is you get to a point where you can take a, a different picture of me, you can force it into the picture. Um, and because it's seen, you know, 50 photos of me and 50 of each of the other people, it can say with some level of certainty that this is me. Um, it may say, like I mentioned earlier, that other people look similar to me. Maybe Sue has the same color skin as me or wears glasses like I do. Uh, but it's pretty clear that the machine here now thinks that, that this is a picture of Saranga. Um, and that's the essence of how um, machine learning works. And most of the AI that you will read about in the newspapers today, I would guess 99% of it, is really this kind of system, of course, done across you know, increasingly interesting forms of data, done at larger and larger scale, done faster and faster, you know, used for all kinds of different applications, but fundamentally it's the same kind of maths that you've just seen here. Um, deep learning, which you may have heard of, is simply machine learning with more than three layers of neural networks. So it's not a very complicated thing to have. You know, the more of those layers of networks you have, the more nuanced it can be in its understanding. You just add more and more of them. So that's what deep learning is. Supervised learning you've already learned about. It's when you give the system that information about this is Saranga, this is Sue, and so on. Unsupervised learning is simply where you send the machine lots of different images, and over time it will say, look, these ones look similar, these ones look similar. I don't know, you know what they are or who they are, so I can't tell Saranga from, from Sue, but I know that this is different to this person. Um, and this is the essence of most of this sort of AI that people are talking about. Um, so why has this AI, why has form-fitting AI and machine learning become so um, you know, prevalent today? And why was it not prevalent 20 years ago? It's not because of the maths. Um, I think as you've probably seen here, um, the mathematics behind this is actually relatively straightforward. Um, it's not particularly complicated stuff. Um, the reason why it hasn't been more prevalent is because of these two things, data and compute. To make machine learning work, you have to have lots of data because you need to be able to show this machine lots and lots of different examples of everything you want it to learn. You also need incredibly strong computing power because all these hugely complex functions will take a lot of time to compute. Um, and why has this changed? Well, the internet has changed the data front. Um, if you go to a website like Google or Facebook and you do a search for cats, for example, you'll get all of these images. If you think about it, this is pre-labeled perfect training data. Now we can, we can send a machine you know, millions of pictures um, of cats 
with the word cats attached to it, and it knows that this is what a cat looks like. If you send a separate set of images for dogs, it can start to tell the difference. Um, and of course, you can get really precise. You can ask for kittens, you can ask for ginger kittens, you can ask for ginger kittens' faces. And, and in this way, you can start to create a very, very fine-grained idea of what, what people are looking at and what the data is. Um, and that's what's really solved the problem on data. And that's why a lot of the initial AI work was done by some of these big internet companies, because um, you know, they're the ones who, for the last few years, have had access to um, huge amounts of, of, of data um, and, and therefore have been able to crack the left-hand side of this problem. The second problem was compute. And this was actually a much harder one. How could you, you know, afford to do all of these calculations? Um, the solution to this has come from an unexpected place, which is these two things, um, uh, gaming and, and mobile phones. Um, you know, whether or not you, I mean, I, I know everyone knows about the right-hand side one. The left-hand side one is a bit generational. Um, but, you know, these two are two of the biggest trends in consumer computing over the last 20 years. Today, the computer game industry is bigger than the movie industry and the um, publishing industry combined, just to give you a sense of scale of that industry. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not particularly common with maybe my generation or, or older, but certainly, you know, in people in their, in their 30s and 20s and, and younger um, spend a huge amount of their time playing video games, much more than they do watching television or movies, for example. And we all know, of course, about mobile phones and, and how um, there are many, many of them. And, you know, there are now more, more mobile phones than there are people on the planet. Um, the, the, the thing that these two things share is that they both are all about beautiful graphics. Um, games work because they're gorgeous to look at. Um, Steve Jobs famously um, shouted or berated his engineers when he built the first iPhone and told them that he wanted icons that were so good you'd want to lick them. Um, I'm not sure that any of, I can, I can recommend doing that to anyone, but, but it gives you a sense of what he was after. Um, and so all this massive focus on graphics and imagery and making things look beautiful has led to an, an amazing level of innovation in what's known as the GPU or the graphical processing unit. These are highly specialized little processors or computers that are very, very good at processing all of the maths required to draw those beautiful graphics for games or for phones. And because we've got lots of games and lots of phones, um, the cost of building these things and the power of building these things have been pushed up all the scales. So they're more powerful and much cheaper than I think anyone predicted they would ever be. Um, what that's done, it, it turns out that those GPUs, which were designed for graphics, happen to be very, very good at the exact same kind of maths, um, things like matrix multiplications that are required for those neural networks that I talked about earlier. And that sort of slightly surprisingly has killed the compute problem. And so suddenly we have the data and the computing power to be able to do these, these machine learning networks. Um, and so that's where AI is, and that's why AI is where it is, and that's, that's how it works. Um, so, so, you know, what gets affected by this and what doesn't get affected by this? I, I hope at this point, now that you've understood a bit about the mathematical foundations of this, you can see that some things could be affected by this revolution, but other things probably aren't. For example, um, any kind of human job that is clerical in nature, that involves fairly routine, similar judgment calls, sort of data entry type jobs, they are under threat. There's no doubt that's the kind of thing you could show lots and lots of cases to a machine and it could learn. Um, that's a sort of obvious on the, on the sort of low end of the income spectrum. The opposite end of the income spectrum, um, people like radiologists actually do this a lot. You know, what they're doing is looking at many, many, many images over and over and over again. Over time, a great radiologist starts to build um, a, a good sense of, you know, you know what, what cancer looks like even before, um, you know, before it's obvious to, to his or her peers. Um, these are the, some of the sorts of systems that maybe not replaced or extinct, but certainly will get um, augmented by computers and therefore will affect the number of people we need to really do these jobs. Um, there are other, jo um, sorry, an another great example is security, um, sort of should be obvious, but we were talking to a company at one point that provided local security for supermarkets. When the company was first started, it had, you know, 10 security guards to cover a number of stores. Um, you know, 20, you know tw uh, 20 years ago, so 30 years after that, it changed because of the world of cameras and it was suddenly cheap to put cameras in all these stores. And that meant they could have three security guards in a central place who could rush off to each place. Today um, or tomorrow, there'll be just one security guard with 100 cameras, way more cameras than you could ever imagine, watching absolutely everything. And an AI that automatically prioritizes where that security guard needs to spend his or her time. Um, so things like this, anything where you see this repeating pattern sort of system, I think you will see change. Um, but there are other things that really won't change. Um, interestingly, um, a bunch of AI researchers did a, did a vote on this and the number one, um, highly relevant for Cambridge, the number one job that they thought wouldn't be replaced by AI was bicycle repair. Um, bicycle repair is um, highly distinct. It's very nuanced. Every bike is a little bit different. 
Um, also, you know, fitting a bike for an individual is a very, very personal thing. It's a bit like tailoring. And, and as a result, it's something which feels like it won't be replaced by AI anytime soon. Um, I would go further and give another Cambridge example. I don't think that Mike Proctor is going to be out of a job anytime soon either. Um, you know, if you think about uh, if you think about his job and what he has to do, you know, balancing the politics of all of those, um, you know, feuding feuding um, fellows and and trying to get you know buildings built and, and and raising the funds to do it and so on and so forth. That's the kind of nuance that the kind of pattern matching that I was describing before. Simply not going to replace that kind of thing. It's a very very human task. Maybe a new kind of AI in the future can, but I don't think I don't think Mike needs to worry about this job his job for for, for a while yet. Um, so going back to the, where I started with all of this um, and to the economic possibilities, you know, what did Keynes get right or wrong? I, he actually got a lot right. Um, income did rise at over 2% per annum compounded, um, but people still do work and they still work almost as much as they used to in his time. Um, why do they do that? Um, it's not because of a lack of technological innovation. It's not because of technology fundamentally changing the nature of the work we can do. Um, there are lots of different sort of views on this, but I, I sort of collated a few of the key uh, theories on this topic. Um, you know, this technology, although it's arrived, what it's also done is enabled new workers. Um, perhaps the best example of this is with women. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the number of hours worked dropped in that in that chart you saw earlier is because of the introduction of women into the workplace. And one of the key enablers of women in the workplace was more technology at home, which allowed the modern household to you know do more of the housework, which allowed both people to go into work. So technology has enabled new workers, which means that on an aggregate level, actually working more overall. Um, technology also allows more work. I mean, going back to the smartphone, you know, um, many of us, before we go to bed, will check our email on our phone, not something we could have done in, in, in yesteryear before we had email, before we had a great email device in our hand. Um, so that's also allowed us all to work more. So it's actually enabled more work rather than de declining it. Um, you also get sort of classic economic effects like the substitution effect, right? So this is where, you know, if you generate more value or more income, you decide that you're going to substitute something for a more valuable version or more expensive version of what, what you already have. So if you make more money, you buy the BMW rather than the Volkswagen and, you know, you make even more money and you want to buy the, the Bentley that goes on top or whatever else it might be. And there's something very human about that. Um, the other thing, which is, I think, perhaps the most tragic reality, which Gaines didn't really didn't really predict was the economic inequality of all of it. So there is an argument that says that there are some countries where there is enough capital actually for people to work 15 hour work weeks, but it doesn't happen partly because of the inequality of how those gains have been distributed. Since the 70s, most countries in the world have become less equal, not more equal. Um, and, and actually people on the lower end of the spectrum are working as hard as ever just to maintain what they had, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and there's also the question of global competition. Keynes spoke about this on a very nation state basis. And actually, of course, our economy is much more globalized, much more connected. And that means that, you know, the, the economic uh, challenges of some countries will bleed into those of others and so on and so forth. And the final point, which to be fair, he did address, as I mentioned earlier, is that people seem to enjoy work. And this is a, you know, one of the arguments is that actually, if you take work away, then you remove a lot of what people are. And, and maybe that's not a good thing. Um, so, so, you know, in, 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 in summary, I think, um, you know, we live in an interesting time. I think there's technology which is going to fundamentally impact, you know, how much we work and how we work even more. Um, I think it's, 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 it's fun for me to reflect on the fact that two, um, you know, very well-known Kingsmen in, in really side projects of theirs um, talked about this topic. And actually, I think it's one of the most fundamental topics of our time. And I think especially with everything that's happened this year and the huge shift we've seen in working patterns because of the coronavirus-led um, uh, lockdowns, um, it's just it's just one example of how you know it's a debate that will that will continue to rage on. That's it. Brilliant, Ranga. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. So we're going to open up um, uh, to uh, questions. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q and A box. I'm, and, I'm going to go uh, and um, do justice. I'm going to go turn on my back my my background light as well because I know I've gotten darker over over time. Well, I wasn't sure whether that was a feature of the talk, you know. <laughs> um, but as I, as I was saying, please type in your questions in the Q and A box, and uh, uh, we will we'll try to go through uh, all of the questions. And um, so, um, excellent. Let me let me kickstart with something that uh, we we had already got. This was from um, uh, we had we had already got from Mansur Ali a, a question. I, and I think it was quite a long question. But the, it, sort of, it sort of was implying that, are you taking Keynes very literally? Is it, uh, you know, even though we are not working those, you know, relatively small hours, yep. has, the, has there not been real improvements in, in people's living standards? 
Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think, uh, so Mansour basically, I think said, you know, let's not take Keynes too literally. He was sort of saying that, um, that actually, um, you know, the, the um, innovation will give us more flexibility about how we work. Um, and actually, if you look at things like how long m many of us spend in education these days, if you look at the length of our retirement periods, despite the fact that, you know, longevity has increased. So we, we all live for many years, um, you know, post working without working and yet are able to do that economically. Uh, if you look at things like gap years, if you look at you know, the length of vacations, um, actually, you know, he has delivered on a lot of this. It's just that we work intensively still in these high periods. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I think, I think where, um, and so in that sense, I, you know, it's a positive thing. And I think that, you know, actually technology has freed up some of this stuff. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I really think a lot of the things around coronavirus are very interesting that way. Obviously there've been many challenges, but also for many people, they've been able to work more from home, be closer to their families, have a much better work-life balance, you know, have better wellness generally and so on. And these are all things that are possible because of technology. So in that sense, it has worked. Um, on the flip side, though, I think I go back to my equality question mark on that. Um, you know, Mansell's right. Um, some of us, um, you know, benefit from being able to be in education for 25 years, work for 30 or 40, and then retire for another 30 or 40. There are many of us who don't, even in, in you know, obviously very wealthy advanced nations. And so um, that has worked, but unfortunately not necessarily for everybody so far. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, obviously the current uh, episode uh, with COVID and changing working patterns, that also has a big implications for the type of work. So you and I might be able to do it from home, um, but a lot of people won't. And the question really is, will people work more once, um, in, in particular services, once we have come out of this uh, COVID episode? I've got, a, I've got a technical question for you. Yep. Um, Michael Wilson thanks you for the talk and says, quantum computing might upset the long-standing equivalence of the Turing machines with essentially all current digital computing. Yep. Can you please expand? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, I should be clear, it doesn't like fundamentally disrupt that. What it, what it does is it, it changes the framework of, um, of, of, of what is computable um, and what is, uh, what is computable in reasonable time. So it will allow us to build highly parallelized um, multi-state machines um, that, can, um, that can analyze problems uh, of multidimensional nature in, in much more efficient time than anything that we have to today. So it changes in, in, in the sense that the Turing machine um, you know, uh, framework is all about understanding the fundamental limitations of, of what computing can deliver today, of what sort of, I guess, traditional um, computing can deliver today. Um, quantum computing brings us a whole new playing field, which allows us to solve a whole new class of problems in a, in a different and more efficient, hopefully, way. Um, so in that sense, it changes the sort of the playing field. It, it doesn't fundamentally affect the, the core thesis because the core thesis is based on the fact that it's based on that kind of computing. And so in that sense, it's, it's, it's rock solid. Um, but it's exciting because it means that a whole bunch of um, problems that we've always thought were essentially impossible uh, may actually be possible. Um, and especially some of the stuff around being able to model um, things like chemical compounds with you know, incredible clarity and, and uh, regularity and predictab predictability um, will, will change industries completely. Um, so I think it's going to be a really interesting time and, and we, you know, we will hopefully live through it in the next sort of 10, 20 years or so. Right. Um, okay. Uh, I've got another one. Uh, which, uh, which says, uh, thanks for the talk. <laughs> so we said from a software engineer uh, for over 40 years. Um, and uh, if allowed to, the management want really long hours and almost continuous startup or crisis mode to get the best, so, so to speak, best out of the workforce. Uh, are we in the danger of heading into a world where few people do a huge amount of work, uh, augmented by all this tech, AI included, and the rest are relatively poverty, living in relatively poverty, um, as a consequence. Yeah, yeah. I, so I think that's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, if, I, um, if I was going to extend on my presentation, I think the next interesting bit to do would be to exactly address that. And in particular, to talk about things like, um, you know, universal basic income, UBI, right? Because I think we are reaching a stage, we already have really, if you think about the most valuable companies uh, in, in the world today, um, they are you know, a small group of primarily American software companies, um, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple, etc. Um, they are phenomenally valuable. Um, they generate huge amounts of value and profit. Um, they seem to do that in an unstoppable sort of way. Um, and, and they are distorting in the sense that actually, if you look at them, if you double click on them, the number of people who work for them and who benefit from all this value is relatively small. Um, so you have this, you know, paradox of yes, huge amounts of value being created, a lot of innovation, 
allowing us to do a lot of amazing things. Um, but the value of that, well, A being, as, 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 the question, as the question said, you know, the work being done by a small number of people and therefore the, the sort of profits of that accruing to that small number of people. How we distribute that is going to be, I think, a fundamental question of the technology age. Um, obviously very tempting to sort of hit, hit the nut with the obvious hammer of things like, you know, mono monopolies and so on. And I think we'll see some of that narrative over the next few years in the US and the EU. Um, but I think there's a bigger societal question as well. Like, you know, if we have an amazing technology which allows us to create so much value that, you know, we can all do less um, and all do more of what we want to do, how do we share that in a way that's equitable? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And also, I suppose it depends, as you said, the tension in terms of, in terms of the tech war across, uh, for instance, China and the US. It's, it, 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 it's very difficult. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, but no, it has absolutely. to be solved, right? Otherwise, yeah. they're, you know, this yeah, is a, this yeah is no, 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 and we and we see it right now with the um, with the Ferrari around TikTok, right? Which yeah, is a exactly. you know, frankly, a, a relatively innocuous product, um, honestly, in, in my opinion. Um, and yet, you've got it being you know highly political. Um, it's basically um, you know we, we're seeing a sort of level of political reaction that's that will be akin to sort of you know I don't know a, a, an American company selling a you know, a nuclear weapon to a, to a, to a, to a foreign state. And so, you know, t t the fact that we're escalating to that kind of thing starts to demonstrate the stakes at, at play, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, had, I had another interesting question. Um, this is more about the use of AI. So yeah. it, it, it is sometimes said that AI in, in the real world serves to reinforce biases and prejudice. Yes. Inherent in the framing of equations, assumptions, mm -hmm. etc. Um, is, is there a solution to this problem? So first of all, it really does. Um, and actually, I, I, I didn't make the joke this time, but last time I made the joke on this because, um, because I had grabbed a photo. If, if, if you remember in the presentation, there's a place where I talk about a problem for the machine learning network and I bring up a page of, of faces um, and the eagle eye, and it's actually from, a, from an original thing. And the eagle eye, I will, sorry, the eagle eyed will spot that they are all um, Caucasian faces. Um, there's men and women, there's young and old, but it's, they're all white. Um, and, 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 you know, if you take a neural network and you show it only white faces, then it will only recognize white faces with any real accuracy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the bias is absolutely there. And I, hopefully you can see from the, so the sort of maths I showed you at a high level, you can see why that would happen. It's just very clear. The machine's not clever. It hasn't got any kind of real understanding. It's just, you know, basing its pattern matching based on what you've shown it and told it. And so, of course, it's going to get biased if you show it biased data. Um, so it's a hugely problematic area. Um, I think. The, the cat is out of the bag with regarding the technology. So I don't think we're going to stop people from using this kind of thing. Um, you know, there was a lot of controversy around, you know, the use of algorithms for the A-level results this year in the UK and things like that, of course. But fundamentally, we're going to, I mean, not that that was a particularly sophisticated algorithm, but we are going to use, you know, we're going to use algorithms for all of these things because it is the right way to do things. It's a sensible, scalable way of doing things. But we need to be very, very, you know, aware of these challenges. Um, there's a lot of work in this area. Um, I mean, actually at Cambridge and at other places as well, but um, in, in trying to understand what the ethical frameworks are um, to, to be able to sort of really be, be open about this kind of thing. Um, there was an interesting um, foundation that was set up in the US a few years ago called OpenAI, uh, which is which you know does a lot of AI research and you know on purpose publishes all of the work, partly to do deal with this threat and to basically be extremely transparent about how you know the systems um, you know work and therefore how they can be biased. Not that every one of us will be able to understand that, but I think if we can have that kind of transparency, then we can have the appropriate debate around it. Um, you know, some bias is exactly what the designer wants, right? When if you're building an algorithm to decide what your car insurance premium should be it will hopefully bias against dangerous drivers um, in favor of those of us who are not so dangerous. Um, but, you know, where's that fair and how do you make that fair and so on? And how do you make sure that some feature that appears relevant but isn't relevant, or maybe it is relevant, we just don't like the fact that it's relevant, you know, starts to bias into it and so on and so forth. So it becomes a very, very complex set of questions. I think the only the immediate answer, honestly, is we've got to be really open about what the algorithms are. I would love for as many of these as possible to be literally open. There's no reason for them not to be. I think that would create enough, um, sort of stimulate enough, um, you know, testing of them that any really obvious biases will be fixed and caught. And any responsible organization that wants to use these sorts of algorithms would, would prefer that, I think, than, than trying to sort of keep it all hidden and then make mistakes. Because mistakes don't help you in the end, right? If you've got a bias that isn't helpful, then actually it will harm your business in the end. Uh, it could also be the case that they're used, these biases are used to uh, influence you in a, you know, think about elections. Yeah. Uh, 
in that case, you don't want, I mean, the, the, the whole design is to uh, exploit these, uh, yeah. right? These characteristics. Yeah, um, no, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I would love for Facebook to be open about the algorithm mm -hmm. it uses for, you know, uh, feed uh, prioritization. Because you know we, we don't know how it does that, and mm -hmm. and you and I have no idea what each of us is being shown in Facebook. Um, all we know is it's probably different, you know. And yeah. so I think that sort of thing is 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 an issue. Um, so we'll have to see if people have the guts to ask for that sort of thing and whether we'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I've got another interesting question. It's um, uh, will I mean we, we you talked a little bit about how AI will rep replace humans in certain mm -hmm. industries, and thankfully at the university level, I think you were saying. They I think you're pretty safe. Ready. Yeah, you're pretty safe. Not now. just Mike, but the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mike definitely. The rest of you, I don't know. I have to. I have to think about that. <laughs> but what? What? But what? What kind of industries or sectors do you think that um, AI could partner with humans to increase our performance? So I think medical is the really, really interesting one. Um, yeah. You know, in a variety of places in the medical industry, in in in, in the health industry or medicine. Um, well, I mean, you know, the reason why it's interesting is because it's it's our it's it's a it's a problem industry, in in my opinion. Um, you know, the the cost of of healthcare um, continues to grow, um, vastly outstripping you know any kind of other economic growth level, um, and yet you know we we don't want to limit it, right? The last thing we want to do is to say, well, we can't afford to help you or or you know fix this or fix that. And if you look at the underlying drivers of that cost, you know. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, a, a lot of it is, is driven by the cost of the discovery in the first place. If you think about all of the research that goes into modern medicine, if you think about all of the effort that goes into pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, for example. Um, and then the second half of it is the very, very human nature of the delivery component. The fact that a lot of what we do in med, a lot of what is done in medicine is still delivered by a very expensive human. Um, and, and if there's any way we can scale those sorts of processes and make them a bit more rapid, I think that would make a huge difference. I, I don't think it should hopefully not be a threat. I don't think we're going to replace radiologists anytime soon. Um, there's a lot of nuance in, in what they do. It's certainly not going to replace the human nature of the delivery of medicine, right? Anyone who's been seriously ill or had a loved one who's seriously ill will know that in many ways it's the, 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 you know, the bedside manner and the way that a doctor or a nurse or a specialist works with you that is as important as actually the science of what they do. Um, and so none of that is going to get replaced by machines. But if we can make that doctor really effective by giving him or her the answers, you know, or, the, or a rough approximation of the answers before they even have to look at things, mm -hmm. that may be cheaper. So I think that's probably the biggest area, honestly, overall, that A, could be affected and B, would have a, a sort of very positive impact, in my, in my opinion. It's, it's also, for instance, I, I know when the, you're diagnosing mm -hmm. whether to use in hip surgery, use this versus that, you know, yeah. and you know, hip replacement. And uh, I, so AI in that sense could, you know, you don't have the human factor. The surgeon doesn't prefer a particular procedure, but has to be done because that's, yeah. so this is quite exciting, actually. Um, I'm not sure what the surgeons would say, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, uh, what about the, uh, so you, we talked a little bit about the 15 hour a day work. Yes. So one question is this, maybe the 15 hour of day work, um, sorry, 15 hours, <laughs> And we'll, we'll get us weaker. We'll, we'll get us the uh, we'll get us the basics, and we need more. As you said, we want we always want more. So this is human nature. Yeah. So maybe Keynes is right after all, but we just want more and more and more. Yeah. I mean, look, you're the macro econ economist, so you have to answer this one, really. But yeah, I mean, I, I I think that's probably true. I mean, the interesting data point that supports that uh, is the fact that some of the um, wealthiest people actually work the hardest um, and continue to work harder and harder and harder. Right? They don't they don't stop. Uh, even even when they clearly have sort of gone through a barrier of of, of any sort of possible regular human need, um, so that suggests there's something inside us that drives us on this sort of stuff. Um, it's interesting reading the essay though, because I think Keynes um, Keynes doesn't really see that. I mean, he he sort of he sort of seems to think that you know, of course, people want to do it a bit, but, but surely they'll understand the value. And, and you know, if you anyone who knows anything about Keynes will know that he had a very rich life. I mean, you know, quite beyond all of the amazing things he did in his in his in his work as an economist, he was involved in so many other things. I mean, it was in, I, I had no idea that he was the founder of the, the arts theater. I learned that earlier today when I was listening to the, to the provost and the senior tutor and, and the, um, the, the bursar talk about, about the college um, this year. And you know, this is the kind of thing that he did with his spare time and his spare money. Um, so I think he set quite a high standard based on himself and maybe some of his contemporaries, but there are some of us who are a bit simpler uh, and for whom the, the, the allure of you know, that, that slightly bigger house is just, is just too hard to give up on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I think I think that's probably right. Yeah. And uh, can I, I'm going to go to something technical. Now, I'm not sure I understand this question. 
so you have to explain it <laughs> as well. Sure. I may but, not either, so let's try, yeah. Um, this is um, on, on quantum computers. Okay. Given that ANS are vectorized and quantum computers are particularly useful for vectorized SIMD calculations, won't the impact of quantum computers on ANNs be quite general rather than limited to a few applications? So in, in a, in a give an example. In other words, couldn't you implement an ANN almost completely on a quantum computer, in particular have really huge vectors or or are we missing something? No, absolutely. That's the theory. That's the theory. Um, and so, I mean, it's just another example of where uh, quantum computing, assuming it works the way that we think it will work and, and you know, is able to scale the way that we think it will, um, will completely change the landscape of what we think of as being, um, you know, a plausible problem scale to approach. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a fascinating, this is why it's a fascinating area. I would argue that the nature of the actual problems it can solve are still in very much the same domain. It's still going to do an ANN type thing. It's just going to be doing it at mass scale. Whether or not that gives us some newer level of intelligence, that, that's less clear to me at least. Um, but, um, but we don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe if you can do it at that sort of scale, then, then it will unlock you know, what appear to be a different class of problem today, but, but maybe they're not. Maybe they just, they just need a, a really, really big boat. <laughs> Excellent. Now I have to take a question from an economist. There were too many engineers and computer scientists. So here, here, here's an, from a, a, my colleague actually at Cambridge, Carolina Alves. She says distribution again, but not so much about who, who will benefit from the value generated by the uh, AI co corporation, but who benefit from technological development per se. So she's asking, what are your views about the idea that some AI products that facilitate education, for example, should be available to vast majority of the population? or used to enhance society's well-being regardless, regardless of affordability? Yeah, I mean, of course, right? I mean, I, I, I think it's difficult for me to say anything, anything but that <laughs> in, in, in this particular case. I mean, um, I, uh, you know, in general, I think, I think um, you know, we, 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 we have an interesting challenge on that right now. Um, if I can broaden it beyond just AI, I would say that question is relevant for technology in general, right? And I think we saw it. Uh, in, in the lockdown scenario with coronavirus, where, you know, if you look at schooling, for example, she mentioned education, so let's use that example. Um, the, the extent to which different schools, different types of schools had access to different technological platforms massively impacted their ability to deliver a meaningful syllabus um, to, their, to their pupils. Um, and, and because that was impacted, because that was differentiated, um, fundamentally, you know, some children will, will have struggled through that period and others will have, have thrived. Um, and that doesn't seem fair um, when, when really the technology is, is, you know, in many ways, the fruits of, you know, broad innovation. That's really, you know, is something that humanity in general has contributed to. So I think that understanding how we spread that is, is key. Um, you know, there are interesting companies like Google who would say that they give a lot of what they do away for free. But of course, they do that at a cost. They do at a price. And, and that price is our information, our privacy, really. Um, there are others who charge a fortune for it. You know, Apple. If you've ever tried to equip a school in Apple computing products, you will know is extremely expensive. But on the flip side, you don't give away any of your privacy or, or, or information. So, you know, there's some difficult trade-offs there about how we how we manage that and how we handle that. Um, one thing I will say is that um, computer scientists, not entirely, but in general, many of them are quite an egalitarian bunch. Um, you know, they they share a lot of their a lot of their sort of political views with scientists and and so on in general and you know a, a big part of that is of course the growth and the birth sorry the birth and the growth of the open source community which is this whole world of computer science where people um, collaborate on projects uh, for free and essentially give away the products um, and and i think that you know many of the most interesting things are being open sourced all the time um, and actually i think as a result um, many of those technologies you know whether they're ai or something else will be available free uh, but there's a lag, right? Inevitably, if, if someone can innovate and build something very powerful, at least in the early days, they'll seek to, to sell that and profit from it. Um, that's natural. I, I suppose also it's not just the technology because the technology might be there, it might be open source, it might be available. Let's say Google makes yeah. everything for free during an extended lockdown period. It's actually to have the infrastructure to be able to you know, connect yeah. to Google, like you know, to have the broadband to have the speed and to have the devices. And I think that's, if you look at the UK in particular, we had a huge problem and elsewhere in, in, in the world actually as well, where you know infrastructure wasn't there, whereas the technology was there, the infrastructure wasn't there and the, you know, the kids couldn't go online. Yeah. Um, so it, it's as much, I think, as technology as the government's uh, infrastructure expenditure and, 
and uh, uh, prioritizing uh, uh, this kind of uh, facilities. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know if if, if we I mean it, it's easy to get quite negative on this topic, unfortunately. Um, but the I think if there is a positive, it's that you know this this whole lockdown remote working thing um, has I think really opened people's eyes as to what's really possible. And you know if you you see it in things like you know the real estate markets right now where you know, large numbers of people are actively making quite large financial decisions around the fact that actually maybe they can live further out of the cities, maybe they can live in, you know, in, in healthier places. Um, this is an amazing thing for equalizing, you know, the value of property in, in large markets. And that's a good thing. I think overall, it makes places more affordable than they once were. Um, and, and, but it also depends on things like the infrastructure being there. And I think I think that's that's a message that the government has certainly received. Now we have to see if if and if and w whether they will do something about it. Mm. Um, but you know, if we if we did, and actually the UK, um, you know, I know Kings is a very global community, so forgive me for being having a bit of a UK focus. But the UK is the kind of country that really ought to be able to do that. We you know we're pretty densely populated. We're pretty small um, geographically. Uh, there's no reason why why we couldn't have really great infrastructure everywhere. It's much mm. harder if you're you know the US or Canada or somewhere like that. Um, so, so really, um, it feels to me like it's an obvious thing, but um, we have to see if the politicians agree. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, they, they, they have another interesting question, actually, is about uh, how AI can help us solve problems. And one problem is the idea that we are the consumption patterns that we have currently is basically outstripping the resources that we have. So, mm. if, if population growth continues, and we, you know, we all want to have all these fancy things. Um, then basically there are not enough resources uh, mm -hmm. to, to satisfy. Um, can AI help us in this, uh, in this sense? I, I think AI, um, can, well, AI and sort of related technologies can assist in this. I don't know that they are, you know, um, a, a sort of magical a, a silver bullet. Um, mm. I think in particular, there's a lot of interesting work around the, the problem, the general problem space of optimization. So essentially mm. looking at um, you know, a, uh, the way that either a process is run or an object is manufactured or, or anything really happens in the physical world um, and understanding, you know, by looking at many iterations of that, um, where, where wastage occurs and then being able to optimize and optimize and optimize to make these things more and more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about medicine earlier, you know, there's some really interesting work around you know, medical devices, which can be a lot more efficient than they are right now. The, the advantage of that being that you can then sell them to a much larger market, they become financially viable, in, you know, in countries where, where the, you know, the cost that one can expend on medicine is, is much lower than it is in the West and things like that. And so that's just one little example, less about waste, more about affordability, but it's, the, it's two sides of the same coin. So I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, we've seen it with supply chain. There's a number of really interesting startups that are working now in the sort of AI meets supply chain world, which is all about analyzing the way, particularly modern, um, you know, modern manufacturing companies assemble these products that are highly complex with parts from all over the world and trying to understand what the supply chain really looks like, trying to optimize it, trying to simplify it. You get a huge cost benefit, but you also get a massive environmental benefit. So there are things like that which will help, um, but I don't know that they are, you know, I, I mean, they'll help, but they're not going to solve the problem. That, that's mm -hmm. a, bigger, a bigger challenge, I think. And I, th I think they're also in terms of policy, macro policy, uh, use of uh, deep learning and, yep. and policy making and evaluating uh, policies become very, uh, I mean, uh, it's becoming more and more mainstream, I think. And, yes. Uh, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's some very interesting work recently at the uh, Treasury here in the UK, mm -hmm. looking at whether AI modeling could be used to understand particularly things like uh, flash crashes, right? So un unexpected events in the markets that then cause a shock, which then has you know, often, you know, really, really negative impacts on, on, on the, the real aspects of the economy. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know how successful that sort of stuff will be, but the fact that people are applying it, uh, is, yeah, it's a good start, right? That's, that's what we have to do, I think. Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm, we are working here in Cambridge with a couple of colleagues on looking at energy policy okay. using this. Uh, so, it, yeah, I think it, so highly it, relevant. It, can go, it can go in any way, yeah. A final question. Um, what do you think is the most challenging problem in the evolution of AI? Um, I, look, I think it's the ethics, um, and we've talked about various aspects of that right mm. now, um, but I think fundamentally it's about the fact that it will give um, either governments or a small number of companies uh, a significant advantage in their ability mm. to sort of manage and shape the world around us. Um, we already see it in China, where facial recognition is used extensively for security. Um, it seems to be societally acceptable there. Um, I'm not on the ground, so I don't know how true that really is. but 
Um, but certainly it's not the sort of solution that I think would work uh, in most Western democracies, right? The idea that um, wherever you go in the street, you can be spotted and your activity tracked and measured and, and used in some way for or against you. Um, and it's the same thing really with, with companies, right? I mean, there are, you know, many people have a, an Alexa in their room that is potentially listening to every conversation that they have. And, you know, what, you know, what, what, what does that tell Amazon about who you are and what you're doing and um, how can that be used in the future? So I think, you know, it, it's an incredibly, you know, while there are real limitations to it and hopefully chatting about neural networks has sort of exposed some of that, um, you know, it's, it's not going to do certain kinds of very human things. Um, there are nevertheless a lot of, there's a lot of power in it. And, and because of the way that the, the, the computation requires big investment capital from a capital perspective, because of the way that certain types of organizations, governments, large companies have access to a lot of the data, um, it means that they naturally become these centers of power in AI. Um, and, you know, I think society as a whole has to figure out how we want to handle that because there's some great, wonderful things and benefits we're going to get from that, but we also need to be able to make sure it, it works for us and not the other way around. <laughs> Brilliant. That, I, that's, uh, unfortunately, that's the uh, end of today's event on uh, Will Alan Turing's technology bring about Keynes's economic possibilities hosted by King's College here in Cambridge. Uh, really fascinating talk, Ranga. Thanks so much for this uh, excellent talk. I, I certainly learned a lot and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, thinking about these issues more. And thanks so much to, to you, the audience, for attending and for, for the excellent uh, questions. I just want to remind you that uh, there will be a recording of this event. The recording has uh, obviously we've been recording the event. It will be available on our uh, website. And uh, just wishing you a good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.